Good evening, everyone. I hope that you've all had a beautiful few days as we're enjoying watching spring come in. And it's the perfect evening for our presidential roundtable, the second in our series of programs arising from the insurrection at our nation's capital. I'm Philomena Mantella, president of Grand Valley State University. And I'm so pleased to be joined by my three predecessors, uh, presidents of Grand Valley State University, Thomas Haas, Mark Murray, and Don Lubbers. Tom, Mark, and Don, it's great to have you with me tonight and with our group. And it really helps underscore the, the importance of this discussion. I want to also acknowledge our co-sponsor, the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation, and thank the many GVSU campus organizations who have supported not only this program, but a series of conversations around our constitution, our democracy, and our elections. And also the Howenstein Center that is our sponsor as well for tonight's program. Tonight, we focus on January 6th. What do we know about the politics and election results that brought crowds to Washington? What was it like inside the Capitol building as representatives and senators were interrupted in their constitutional duty? Hundreds of crowd members have been arrested and charged with serious crimes. Where do we go from here? as some who were caught up in the melee now seek to downplay their participation. We have two experts with us this evening who will share their observations and respond to our questions. I am going to turn it over to my colleague, President Mark Murray to do the introductions. Mark. Well, President Mantello, thank you. And uh, it's very good to be here this evening. Uh, we're honored uh, to have, uh, through the miracle of Zoom, uh, coming in from uh, Brooklyn, New York, Hestad Herndon, who's political reporter for the New York Times, an experienced journalist, graduate of Marquette University, and uh, previously with the Boston Globe, did city reporting there, uh, then went to their DC bureau, now with the New York Times, and uh, very close and active to this most recent election, an election unlike anything I think any of us have ever seen before. Uh, I also were joined by Lisa Desjardins. Uh, many of you know her from the PBS NewsHour. Uh, she's been there, I believe, since 2014, the uh, political director there. Uh, extensive journalistic background at CNN, uh, AP, and others, uh, graduate of Marquette University. I'll keep the introduction short because our goal here is to get ourselves uh, uh, into a good discussion, which will involve us, but also involve the audience. So thank you very much. Asted, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. And I want to thank Grand Valley State for having me. Uh, this is an important topic, and I am honored to be a part of it. Uh, I, as you said, I'm a national politics reporter at the New York Times, and I've spent basically the last three years uh, on the road. Uh, that included the presidential primary that led up to this election, uh, but also doing stories about how politics has been affecting folks on the ground. Uh, and so I have was not at the Capitol on the 6th, but I've done reporting about conspiracy, about uh, uh, kind of Trump supporting, and have gone to dozens and dozens of rallies and others that have led to writing stories that I say I believe uh, uh, showed us that that thing was possible. Uh, I also spent two months in Georgia leading up uh, to that election after November. Uh, it was a crazy year last year, and I think that speaks to the themes that we are looking to highlight here, but I really believe that this is a kind of core uh, question of democracy that the country is running up against that brings in issues of race, issues of gender, uh, uh, and it kind of speaks to what is, whose democracy is it? is what we wrote the day after the 6th. And I think that is the clear, clear question that um, we're gonna try to answer here. And um, I'm, my name is Lisa Desjardins and uh, I, I grew up in politics. As a four-year-old, I was playing with my Barbies in phone banks. So I've seen a lot of politics in my career and that's part of the reason that I became a journalist was because of what I saw growing up in politics. And you know, I think just to echo what Ested said, first of all, thank you to Grand Valley State, the Howenstein uh, Institute. This is a phenomenal and phenomenally important topic. Um, and 
you, I think you have um, created a space to do some really important thinking in a time when I, our country is being led by emotion. And I see that uh, nowhere more present than inside the US Capitol itself and, and seeing the rioters crash through the doors on January 6th, it, it was all about emotion and all about mob mentality. And I think Ested said it very well. This is a question about whose democracy is this? This is an identity crisis in this country. Not our first one, uh, but this is a time where we are seeing some very um, important choices being made. The question is these tensions between us and them, perhaps between emotion and thought, what is going to last and what is going to be temporary that we don't know yet. Well, uh, thank you both for uh, those introductory remarks. Uh, I'm going to offer a first question, and I'll, I'll offer it to you, Lisa. You were there at the Capitol, and uh, you, you mentioned the mob. Uh, it, there really is, are deep divisions in this country at this point. And uh, I, I'm curious your perspective. You, you're, a, you're a mainstream journalist. You've been with mainstream journalism. There are lots of kind of new channels of information, which seem to some degree to be fomenting the mob or building up our divisions, people living in their own echo chambers. I'm curious to your reflection on that a little bit. Uh, I remember Frontline did a piece on, on Facebook and the need to kind of keep people agitated, to keep them coming back. I think you call it kind of clickbait. I'm curious your perspective on that. And then uh, we have, I hope, some prospective journalists, uh, students listening to this. How do you manage this professionally to keep us mm -hmm on the track of staying united with fact and with reason, as opposed to some of the uh, fomenting of division that's just too much part of our current community? Oh, those are excellent questions. Um, I think in terms of uh, how to stay objective and how to keep covering this, yeah, I think the more experience you have as a journalist, the better it served you in this time. The last four years were an incredible challenge for anyone covering politics. You know, I had certainly been under attack as a journalist before President Trump came into office. I had been at rallies, I'd been at campaign events where people had thrown things at me, you know, not knowing me, just at the journalist standing there. But it certainly got much worse during the Trump administration, much more challenging, uh, much more, I think, open, and transparent that, that there was an attack on journalism itself. But I think that for us, the, the more experience you've had doing that and just you have to stay steady and keep your eyes focused on the truth uh, and, and not be distracted. And I think that speaks to your other question, which is the rise of splintered media, you could call it, um, media that is trying to gain viewers by sometimes stoking sensationalism, sometimes stoking conspiracies. And we have seen this, especially in the Trump era, but it's not, it's, it's really an expression of something that was happening in cable news already, something that was happening on Fox News. And we've seen, I, I have to say, I think that TV news, especially cable news, has probably been um, added the most fuel to the fire in the media world. I'm not saying it's all to blame on cable news, but I think we saw um, across the spectrum, different outlets uh, gaining ratings in taking a position that was either attacking or defending. And again, you know, you can debate why that was and, and if that was valuable or not valuable. But one of the outcomes of that was that Americans themselves started picking news outlets like they were picking teams mm -hmm. and became very incensed about that. And I'm, I'm lucky PBS is, tries to stay out of that fray a little bit, but I, I think you can't deny that um, all of these things are intertwined with outlets more on the end of the spectrum, more fringe outlets, which, which are putting out conspiracy theories uh, that seem unbelievable to most Americans, that puts the middle of the spectrum um, on the media, more places we think of more mainstream, sometimes also putting out conspiracy theories, maybe not as wild, but by comparison, when you've got the outliers going in such a wild, unhinged direction, uh, the mainstream was able to also sometimes be untethered. And I think that, that, that certainly increased problems, but, you know, chicken and egg, was this because of 
issues with Americans themselves or was this the media? I think both played together. Thank you. I Thank wonder you. if you wanna add any commentary Astrid, to that, um, to Lisa's remarks. Yeah, I think that the, the uh, fractured nature of media, the ability for people to kind of self-select uh, confirming views is a huge problem. I can say as someone who uh, was in Georgia, uh, you know, bouncing between events from the Republicans and Democrats, you were dealing with a completely different reality among voters. I mean, among some of those voters did not believe that Joe Biden had got more votes, right? Kind of baseline things that I think we would all consider fact or objective were not to be believed. And so if that is the kind of starting point, it's hard for us to have a you know, the functioning democracy that we say we do, if we can't get to a kind of agreed set of facts that kind of govern the rules. I think that's a huge challenge, you know, I, and I think it's important for journalists to kind of keep our eye on the ball and not necessarily always uh, um, the ball of, of neutrality or, or positioning ourselves right in the middle of both parties. But I think uh, uh, issues like fairness and transparency, being open with readers and, and, and folks who are talking to uh, about what we're trying to do. I think you can both hold on to the facts and you, know, you don't want to, you, don't want to uh, you know, as Lisa's saying, let the conspiracies on the fringe pull you out. But I also think that uh, we want to be able um, to inform, but also to indict sometimes, to say that this is not true, to say that they, you know, put things in context and, and say that is the value add of what we're going to do. Now we know that that may put some folks off, um, but you know, I think that we have have to come around to a level of comfort that you know, if if we're going to be, if the new reality is a, a politics that is you know a, a mired in conspiracy theory or or you know in a web of of kind of untruths, uh, I think we have to feel more comfortable being openly uh, uh, resistant to that because you know our eye on uh, you know when we say eye on the ball, we mean facts, we mean reality, we mean context. And I don't I don't think that that means being unfair. I don't think that means being uh, uh, you know, uh, particularly uh, tied to one side of the spectrum. But I do think that means we can't shy away from saying, hey, this is true, this isn't true, and here's how we came to that conclusion, and kind of putting that in front of readers to say, we still feel like this falls within our boundaries of transparency, of fairness, but we're also being clear-eyed at the same time. Great, thank you. I'd like to ask, we're going to invite um, our other two presidential colleagues to uh, offer a question to each of you. And I'm giving fair warning to those in the audience that you can think of your questions and put them in the chat. And I'll do my best at picking them up and offering them up to our new colleagues. So Tom. Great to have uh, you all here and appreciate the opportunity of listening and learning from you. As Dr. Murray said, we might, uh, and I'm sure we do have some journalist students uh, with us here tonight as well. But as we know, integral to our democracy is an informed citizen. And I wanted to drill down a little bit uh, in terms of what uh, I heard here. Uh, how do you ensure the integrity or the truth of your work, especially in these times where there's so much distrust in our news reporting? <laughs> uh, I, I, I guess I'll start. I think that um, I think that that's a huge question. And to me, I think that uh, to, to win folks trust, whether you're doing it in person and trying to get them to, to be open and honest with you in an interview setting, or you want someone to trust uh, the report that you're putting out, the story you're putting out, I think that you need to one, um, kind of uh, prove your intentions, prove your the kind of good faith nature. You know, I've, I've, I've talked to folks from Black Lives Matter protests to Trump stock, a Woodstock of Trump fans. And I think that something that unites both of those groups is their initial skepticism to places like the New York Times. That can come um, from, from, from the left and the right. Uh, and I think that that is because I think we should acknowledge there has been real harm and real uh, that, that media has, um, has done to some of these communities. There also has been uh, I think an unwillingness for us, an, un, an unwillingness for us uh, to kind of be fully transparent and, and open with I think readers with how our process happens and 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 what uh, they can come to expect from our like uh, commitment to accuracy and rigor. So I think that being as transparent as possible, whether interpersonally when you're talking to someone or in your stories, is important. Say how you reached this. Say why the, the why the source is anonymous. And I think if you take folks through those steps. Uh, I still find people 
people willing uh, to, to, to take the to, to, to trust the paper. I think you also just need to build the argument over time. You know, you need to make sure that, uh, you know, I, I like to say that, you know, every new person you talk to, if you do that well, they'll introduce you to somebody else, hopefully, right? And extend, the same can be true in the story too. At the same, if you put enough, uh, I think, um, uh, uh, if you put enough into something that folks can, I think, come to know your byline as someone who takes this stuff seriously, hopefully the next story and the next story will do that same type of work. And I think you wanna build that argument over time that people can come to trust you, not only to be fair and accurate, but also to uh, you know kind of cut through the noise, which I think there's a lot of um, in this political environment. Yeah, I agree. Transparency is exactly the right word. I think in addition to that, we have to really make much more effort, and I think we're doing this now, um, to show that we're listening to everyone. I think it's easy for in the media to think we're telling the story. You know, this is, and, and I think it, for a long time, it's been growing that Americans have mistrusted the media because um, maybe the, they think the media believes that it is in charge of the narrative, you know? And I think we have to do everything we can to let American voices speak for themselves, you know, and to show Americans that we're going to listen to them. And that has to mean a much wider group and wider selections of stories than we've done before. You know, I think both of our New York Times and PBS, like we, we do a lot of stories, you know, and we, I think we're both newsrooms that have thought of themselves as inclusive, thought of themselves as trying to look everywhere for stories. And, and I know that, that we've missed a lot, you know, that I think we've been, we've had blinders on. And I think we all need to, um, as part of transparency, I think it helps to admit when you're trying to make yourself better and when you see your own flaws, which I think is a conversation a lot of people are having in the media right now. And I, I think the more that you can find um, people's own voices and especially stories that aren't getting told, it's kind of cliche to say that, but I just think we're, we're doing a better job now. We're starting to look in other places yeah than we were before. And I think that that helps with the trust and that includes conservative voices, liberal voices, all yep. of it. Thank you, Lisa. Um, President Lubbers. Don, I think you're on mute. Don, you're on mute. Now, can you hear me? Yep, you're good now. Okay, did you ask me to ask a question? I did. All right. I was wondering from both of you, uh, in this time when we have so much, uh, so much noise, how do you sources? How, how do you evalu evaluate your most mm -hmm. reliable sources? Mm -hmm. And do you tend to go back to the same people uh, or do you constantly find new people to consult and ask? That is a great question. I guess I'll kick it off. Um, you know, it's been even more challenging, of course, in the coronavirus because we don't have face-to-face -face interactions with most of our sources anymore. And that tells you a lot. That, that definitely helps with source relationships, but we can't always do that anymore. I think that part of the job is you, have to, you do have to constantly source build um, part of the problem I, I bet for both of us is that the last two years have been just a frenetic sprint every day, you know, 18 hour days, uh, for months and months and months. And you have, you, it is hard to build new sources, but even just, it's funny now, I feel like we've finally have reached a moment where just last week I started my list of who, who do I need to, where do I need to source build? And I just, this week have started to really push out and talk to new sources. Who do you trust? You know, I go by the age old uh, adage, you don't even trust your mother. You can't trust anybody. Uh, you know, but I think there are some sources that you know that you, you rely on because they've given you good information in the past. Um, and, and you have to, you just go to them, especially in a town in Washington where fewer and fewer people, especially in the Trump administration, actually knew what was going on. There were very few sources that had good information. So it was difficult. 
Yeah, I think that that is uh, uh, certainly a part of it. You know, for people like me who are doing, um, uh, you know, outside Washington, uh, kind of the the impact of politics, you want sort you want to talk to people who I think see things before other people who know the tension mm -hmm. points. Who uh, and I think that it comes a lot, and I think a lot of our industry is talking now more about the need for a diversity of sources. That you know, you you don't want to be in, uh, completely reliant on one person, one group, or one train of thought. That you want to be able to be talking to uh, lots of different folks you're able to kind of see uh, through um, maybe what you know one person knows or one person doesn't and the real combination is the place in the middle uh, I, I you know we on our team are you know we try to think a lot about connecting dots before other folks do and that you know that that you know we have a great Washington team who will know the pieces of information or by Biden, what Biden's doing today I think a real value add in terms of what we want to round out our coverage to be is to be kind of uh, talking to folks uh, from the bottom up what do the what does Washington not know that is out there in the country that folks are trying to get to them and I think that that's the kind of things that I also think about is where uh, and I think that comes in reading uh, 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 local news that's happening out and elsewhere about the impact of policy that comes with, uh, you know, community groups or political groups who kind of track some of this stuff and may know that something's affecting them more. And that certainly has changed with the virus. As someone who was on the on the road, you could not have those in person meetings, but you could go, hey, uh, uh, you know, you are you are more reliant on local officials uh, to, to try to point you in the right direction. You are more reliant on uh, on you working things over the phone. And that's not a perfect thing. That's certainly going to have folks fall through the cracks. But I think that that level of effort and intention has to be kind of top of mind. Otherwise, you're going to fall into the same type of thinking that I think can be a, a plague in political reporting. And I really think that, you know, if, if nothing else, one of the things that 2016 election taught us was that we can't just be relying on that conventional thought. We have to some points break through that. And we have to look elsewhere uh, for people uh, uh, who may not be within our, our normal source community. And I do think that the industry um, is doing a better job at that uh, in the last four years than what we would say before that. Okay, we're gonna start on the audience question and we'll start with, and I'm gonna take these pretty much in order and skip those where your comments may have already given, offered us some insight. So the first is, could you address the fairness doctrine? and if it has had an impact on the changes we're experiencing. And it's for both of you. I guess I can kick it off as the broadcaster here. Yeah. <laughs> I got you, exactly. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, sure, the fairness doctrine. I think there, there is, there remains discussion about the fairness doctrine, which a, a lot of the folks watching might realize is, is most well known um, as the concept that uh, one point of view uh, that broadcasters must broadcast points of view in equal measure. Uh, and that for a while was interpreted as the idea that for a minute of Republican thought must have a minute of democratic thought. I'm way oversimplifying, but, that, but that's the general idea. Um, but during the Reagan era, uh, the fairness doctrine was dissolved essentially. And many people have, in hindsight, pointed to that as sort of what led to the rise of Fox News, led to the rise of Rush Limbaugh. Now, they're right about Rush Limbaugh, but something to understand about the Fairness Doctrine is that it only applied to broadcast airwaves, did not apply to cable television. So this brings us to modern day. And there are people who say we need a new Fairness Doctrine so that there are that any news outlet whatever it is, must broadcast views in equal measure. Um, that is something that some Democrats think is a good idea, but they don't have the votes. I don't think they have anywhere near the votes for it. Uh, it, it would have a lot of complicated effects potentially, and you would have to vote to include cable news, which was not in the original fairness doctrine. But it is something that, that I know some Democrats continue to talk about. I, I don't think they're close to, to doing it but it's something that's worth discussing. Right. Um, can you give us some advice for our student journalists? Speak to the students now, both of you. Ah. What, 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 what's your, you know, your one piece of advice you want them to yeah. walk away with? I think um, I can say, uh, 
Um, you know, I, I'm young. I uh, graduated college in 2015. So right, and I uh, immediately went to the Boston Globe and, and had a path that has brought me here. But I think that even in that time, um, I was uh, not a particularly involved uh, collegiate, you know, you're, everyone on this call is probably a better collegiate journalist than I was. But I do think that uh, there is a, you know, my piece of advice would really be to invest in a knowledge area or a topic and that you can get better at the kind of mechanics of journalism, right? I think that you can get better at writing leads, at revising, at kind of doing the, that type of work. Well, I really think the biggest growth point from in school to out of school was about the type of communities that you need to be comfortable around to, to, to source build, the type of uh, uh, the type of diversity of, of thought that you're going to run into. And I just, I just think that college was such a bubble that that is actually the biggest, um, the biggest thing to grow at was making sure you were, were, were kind of prepared as a, as a full human to do the stuff, the work that I think journalists need to do. That first year and a half outside of school, I was the Boston Globe's crime and general assignment reporter. So I was going to murders and fires and overdoses and things like that daily. And it was such a um, education and just uh, uh, the, you know, the real intense, you know, the intensity of folks' lives who were coming into the kind of worst day of their life every day. And I think as a journalist, you need to be ready for that. And you need to really take um, pride in telling folks stories, even in those situations. And I think that um, once you kind of get a comfort in doing that, you can make up all of those other steps. And so, you know, whether uh, if you want to go on political journalism, if you want to do health or science or other journalism, I would still say that kind of basics uh, uh, of reporting and, and making sure that you're uh, building out a knowledge area that even challenges the, the, the communities that you might be most comfortable around will be the thing that benefits you the most. Because I think you want to be a type of reporter who can go into any place, who can go into any community and still get the work done. And I don't think uh, that, that, you know, and so I think that that's the place where I knew that I needed to do the most growth from college to out of college. That is such, that is a great piece of advice. Forming a specialty is, is dead on. You have a knowledge base. I, I think to that, I would ask, I would add, um, something that I think when I see younger journalists rise and students who just come to news hour and the ones who rise the most quickly, you've got to raise your hand and lean in, you know, and, and you have, and look around you in your newsroom, see what others are doing and ask to collaborate with them. You know, don't wait for people to reach out to you and say, look at you, you're so talented. I want to raise you up. Now that's great. That should happen in newsrooms. That's, that's, you know, me as a more experienced reporter, I should be doing that, but you can't count on that. You need to show your newsroom that you are proactive because any reporter, all you've got is hustle. So you've got to show that hustle within the newsroom also. Uh, reach out to people, you'll find the people who are going to help you, the people you can collaborate with. Keep pitching story ideas until you figure out how to do it, how, what, what the newsroom wants. It, it takes a year or two to really figure out a newsroom's vibe and what your editors want. So keep pitching and pitching and pitching, get ready for a lot of no's, but then each no you have to think, that's building you up in your editor's eyes. They know that you're trying, they know that you've got the gumption and kind of the hustle that it takes to be a journalist. So just keep raising your hand, keep just talking to everyone and asking to collaborate with anyone that you can. Thanks, such great advice. Um, you both get up in the morning, you have your cup of coffee. How do you get your news? <laughs> oh, it, dep it definitely depends on whether Congress is in session or not. <laughs> but um, I, I do, I, when President Trump was in office, I, my first thing I did was look at Twitter and I looked at his Twitter feed it was the first thing I did. Um, I'm now getting Twitter withdrawal and it, I like it. It's okay. Now I have a healthier relationship where probably the first thing I do is I'm, I'm checking checking my email and then I'm reading, you know, four or five newspapers right away. I'm scanning the politics section, the times, of course, as Stead's work, Washington Post, Politico. I read a couple of Hill newspapers, Roll Call and The Hill. And then every day, speaking to something as Stead said earlier, every day I read one newspaper that's not a Washington newspaper. I have about two dozen newspapers all around the country that I particularly love. Uh, in different states. And, and every day I make sure that I'm reading some headlines in Wyoming. Like for example, the Wyoming State Senate is working on 
a very interesting um, bill on guns. And, you know, because I, I read one of their papers, I knew that. So I, I make sure to do that because we have such a herd mentality in Washington that it's one thing that helps me. I think that's great advice. I, you know, I think, uh, uh, I, I feel like news consumption can be overwhelming sometimes. I mean, there's so much, there's so many uh, uh, newsletters, uh, you know, blog, you know, Twitter that you can kind of feel. I feel like I, at this point, I have a cadence of both reporters elsewhere, uh, papers elsewhere that I trust and that I, you know, I have a kind of curated list of people more so than institutions mm -hmm. that I feel like are doing work that keeps me on top of things. And then as Lisa said, I try to make sure that I am reading something that is not, um, uh, um, you know, Washington specific. You know, during the Trump era, I joined a bunch of a ton of very Trumpy Facebook groups and I prioritized them all on my news feed. And so every time I would log on Facebook, it would look as if I was just like a regular baseline Trump supporter. And I found so many things through that. You know, that that Woodstock Trump thing that I told you about was from just seeing that in that kind of community's chatter. I try to make sure that particularly in this age where so many things can bubble up through internet or us uh, elsewhere, I think sometimes Twitter, the Fox News is, can be the last step, not the first step, that I'm also in trying to be ingrained in those places. But, you know, I think it can be very overwhelming. Um, and so uh, I basically, like, when I find a story or a person that I think is doing the work on that, that in the way that I find important, I really tend to latch on to people uh, because I think that that gives me some sense of comfort uh, that, you know, um, maybe I won't be reading an education newspaper every day, but I have enough folks who I trust in that work that I will see um, when, you know, some education story is, you know, is certainly wrapped up in a politics thing. And I think that those you also have to kind of know, particularly as political reporters that can touch on everything. You have to like, I think you have to have a, a, a toe in all of those worlds. Thank you. I'm going to throw it back out and see if President Lubbers, Haas, or Murray would like to ask a follow up, and then I'll go back to the uh, audience. Well, I'm rather interested. You were, you were talking about the Georgia situation, and there has been some talk about uh, charging President Trump for trying to affect the election. Uh, as you do your your reporting, as you do your investigating and your reporting. What are you finding uh, in the country about uh, charging people who are trying to affect uh, elections illegally? And is there any kind of a movement to try to, to bring them to trial? Or are we more uh, in, a, in a situation where let's just let bygones be bygones? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely can't speak to the, the legal question. You know, there are so many, we have a lot of good reporters who are trying to figure out what all the DAs are thinking on that front. And, you know, I'm not one of them. I don't want to speak to that. I can say from the political angle and talking to a lot of folks across the country about this, I don't think there's consensus among base Democrats or base Republicans about how much there wants to be a look back at the Trump era in terms of accountability versus how much it's about moving forward with Biden agenda and priorities. On the Republican side, there's a kind of universal agreement that they do not kind of hold Trump uh, up, you know, uh, culpable uh, for the events of the Jan January 6th. But we know among independents, among some of folks kind of center right, that's been a place where Trump has lost a lot of ground in places like Georgia uh, and elsewhere. You know, uh, what changed from November when the Republicans looked in pretty good shape in those Senate races to uh, to to that, you know, to them losing in two months was not just, in, you know, the Democratic base came back out, but a real depression among Republicans and a real uh, a kind of fall off from that base. And so both of these things are happening in tandem. You both have Democrats who are torn between the idea of, of unity and, and what does that mean? Does that require accountability? Does that require uh, kind of bringing Trump uh, uh, to bear? There are some Republicans, though, who will tell you in private that they want their party to break from Trump on, on the kind of Washington level and that they're relying on the court system to do what they think is going to stop him in 2024. So there are a lot of different interests converging here, both political and personal. 
all. And so I don't think we can say, I, I don't think from my reporting, there is a universal agreement among Democrats or Republicans about what they want to happen to Trump going forward. I frankly think that reflects the fracture, uh, polarized nature of, of who has been certainly the, you know, the most controversial modern president in terms of the, the loyalties he inspires and the backlash. So one thing we've been doing at NewsHour to try and get as many, um, you know, just regular American voices and get in touch with Americans, you know, so that we're not just relying on Twitter, not just relying on, a lot of us have a, a few dozen people around the country we've talked to for years, um, is we've been doing call outs and we've been just asking our viewers to send in, um, and not just our viewers, but wide groups of people uh, to respond to different ideas. And we get hundreds and hundreds, sometimes thousands of responses. And I'm a spreadsheet nerd. I love spreadsheets. So I always organize these spreadsheets and I look at these and I definitely, I have seen in those answers and also in voters I've personally talked to and in members of my own family, as well as sources that I've had for years, I think for every Democrat who believes that um, President Trump should be indicted or held criminally responsible, and there are a few Republicans who feel that way too, for January 6th or for anything regarding the election, I think there are more Republicans, um, Trump supporters, who believe that there is still an underlying problem in the 2020 election, who still believe what President Trump falsely said. And I think that that distrust is, is quiet. You don't hear a lot about it, but I think it is still deep in a lot of conservative Trump voters' minds. And I think we shouldn't forget it. And, and I think how to get that trust back, sometimes time can heal that. Sometimes a stable presidency can, ha can handle that, like the Biden hopes he will have. But on the other hand, you have uh, Republicans who are trying to use that to their advantage in the next two years who want to keep up the idea that our democracy is not to be trusted, who think that will help generate enthusiasm, deal with that enthusiasm gap that Ostad was talking about. And I, I think we have to pay very careful attention to it because it is, um, it is it thought, it, these are thoughtful conservatives who, again, listened to one voice and one group of media telling them that there was fraud, an election where, honestly, it was one of the most successful elections in terms of um, pulling off uh, the democratic process, perhaps in human history, uh, with, with relatively little error and almost no fraud. But I'm just saying there are many people who still have very big doubts. So I, I think the question goes the other way. I think there is more concern from the conservative end. Um, and I think it's based on falsehood, but it is something that is still there. President Haas. Sure, I'll uh, ask a question. Uh, as a journalist, and we have social media that's impacting the whole industry. How do you uh, filter out the noise? <laughs> well, luckily we have literal filters on Twitter. <laughs> we can start and stop. Um, you know, there's sometimes where we, we actually want the noise, you know, as you're hearing, because we want to know uh, where the outrage is, you know, whether it's rational or not. You know, I've found that when um, I've been fortunate that I, I you know, our, our viewers, when they have a problem, usually they're incredibly polite about it. But whenever I end up in a situation where I'm under attack, I've actually found that, um, you know, I'm careful. I look at who I'm talking to and their history. But if I engage a little bit and if I engage politely, I often can get something out of that conversation that I didn't know before, even if someone is coming at me, attacking me. Um, and that's in person. And that's also on Twitter. I, I don't always do it, but sometimes rather than filter, I lean in because I want to understand what they're saying. Yeah, I mean, I think that social media can be a uh, positive journalism tool, right? It can be uh, one that I think has forced new voices into the conversation that I think has rid us of some bad traits, frankly. I think that, uh, 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 you know, I think back to words like racially tinged and charged that have basically been removed from the journalism lexicon because of kind of criticism driven by social media. But frankly, I think a lot of folks have been voicing within their newsrooms for a long time uh, on the same way, in the same way, it can really be a, a distorted view of the political conversation. It could be, it could really, it over represents a certain type of voter. And, uh, you know, in, in, uh, 
and it really uh, erases another type of voter. And so as someone who was on the ground and covering the election, it would be important for me to not only know what that kind of conversation was that was happening among activists, among folks who are kind of politically connected that you can see kind of play out on Twitter, but you also have to know what they're missing too. And I think that that is kind of our kind of unique position is that you should be making connections with those folks who are still being erased in that online conversation. Because you, your job is not just to understand what political Twitter is talking about, but the actual election. And I think that that is much more uh, robust than, uh, uh, than that, and then that conversation online. So we know, for example, that the type of Democrat who's not really involved in, uh, who's not on Twitter, is uh, from the South, is majority black or brown, is not college educated. And that is the kind of voter that is not being included here. So you know when you're seeing those conversations that are happening on strict ideological grounds, on clear left-right boundaries, that's not how most people come to their decisions about who they're gonna vote for for president. And so while it can be important, I think you also have to contextually know the limits of Twitter uh, and, and that conversation. And I think that, uh, Frankly, I think, though, that if you are kind of owning your beat and knowing and talking to a diversity of folks and the like, you can get that. Um, you know, it can. And so I think that uh, you have to filter out the noise, certainly. But Twitter can also be a tool to push your institution, to push the industry. Um, and I think uh, to include uh, some voices who have been pushing from the outside in media. Um, and it's a kind of water cooler of media that can sometimes be good, even though it's sometimes, you know, a disaster. President Murray, did you want to ask a second question? Well, I ask a, a, a maybe I hope a quick one. I I'm awfully impressed with the degree to which you're sharing with us the life of a journalist and uh, what it what it's taken, what 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 your plans are going forward, broadening of sources, et cetera. I'm a little curious. Uh, all my professional experiences there were people I really admired and really looked up to. And I'm wondering if you can tell us who in journalism are some of the people you individually admire mm -hmm. the most and in, in, in some sense try to model yourself after. Oh, that is a great question. Um, I'm going to start and then I'm going to probably think of more. <laughs> when you go. I, I have to say it um, might be predictable, but when I am having a hard time with a story or a hard time with writing a story, or figuring out who I want to call or how I want to see a story, I do think about Gwen Ifill. And, and she was just such a phenomenal journalist. I mean, I still can't believe I was able to work with her and I was able to work with her as long as I did. I still can't believe she's gone. Here, here. Right? But I, I, I have to say she had an incredible ability. I got to sit in morning meetings with her day after day as we wrestled with how we were gonna cover difficult things. You know, Stormy Daniels, what do we do with that? You know, she, I was there when it was clear, we thought for most of the time for our show, for a one hour show to present what's happening in America, a lot of days that was a distraction. And I, I hear Gwen's voice in my head a lot about what is distraction and what are the right questions to ask? That is how she started every, everything. What is the right question? And for journalism students listening, you go back and look at some of Gwen's writing. Um, it, her leads are phenomenal and her questions were excellent. Uh, among the great skills she had that I think about whenever I do an interview on our show, her questions were short. Her questions were short. When uh, Black Lives Matter was rising, we brought on a young woman, uh, at, you know, in kind of after everything was happening in Ferguson, and you know, the whole news and what we had so many questions, so many things we wanted to ask these activists. And Gwen's first question was simple. She said, why do you march? Mm -hmm. You know, that that kind of that kind of really incisive and direct to the heart kind of question is what I want to get at. And I think about her a lot. Yeah, that's a great one. I mean, I think that there are so many people who come to mind. You know, I, I think that there are, and Gwen Eiffel was certainly one of them. There is a legacy, you know, I think of, I, there is a legacy and a history of particularly, uh, you know, Black reporters who have uh, been, you know, uh, trying to push uh, about what objectivity looks like, about what fairness looks like. And, you know, I uh, was someone who didn't really think about doing journalism until uh, we got involved with the Association of Black Journalists. And I really found 
found um, a community of people who were who were really passionate about uh, that. You know, the values of journalism were not at odds with uh, with the values of equality with our with with our identity, and you can merge all of those things. And that actually, you know, the kind of truth and the baseline of reporting is is something that we are uniquely um, uh, uh, kind of able to see as a part of folks who have spent time, at, you know, their lives on the margins of the country. And so, you know, the Gwen Eiffels, you know, I can say folks who are out there now, um, uh, Yamish and Abby, uh, Philip, um, people like Josh Jamerson at Wall Street Journal, I mean, uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones at the Times, these are people who, when I was in college, were like very nice to me about um, how they were making the, the profession work for them. And I think about all the, the, uh, all the time in terms of uh, uh, the, that tradition of really saying, uh, uh, you know, you can be your full self and you can also be a good journalist at the same time. And I'll give one other blanket recommendation too. This is sometimes when I, I feel like I'm in a writing rut where I'm not coming up with original ways to say things. Um, I will I will do one of two things. I'll try and also pull up a, an old Candy Crowley package from CNN. She's a phenomenal television writer. Um, or I will read the sports section because some of the best writing I think um, in print is, is in sports sections are really good sports writers. If, if you're looking for kind of creative ways of covering stories, I recommend that to all you young journalists. Yeah, it's actually, I read uh, obituaries and like wedding vows. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I feel like everyone has the section that people right? really think are the best writers. And I think like obituaries and I really love like the Robin Gibbons, the Vanessa Friedman's, like things that I like, yeah. the universe of like, I don't really know anything about fashion, but I read those sentences and I care about it. And I think that's like a unique thing that can even inform your work when you're not writing about those topics. Let's stay with journalism as a field just a little bit longer and ask the question. One of our, our uh, audience members has asked if journalism has taken a hit because of the stress mm. and strain uh, on, on journalists today. And also there's another question, is local and community-based journalism worth saving and can it be saved? So on the journalists and then local and community-based journalism. Certainly worth saving. Yeah. Uh, it is not being uh, it is not being pushed out by any fault of its own. I mean, I would say that there are corporate structures here that have just eaten um, local journalism alive, um, and I think that. That is a core. I mean, when we talk about the erosion of kind of news literacy, when we talk about the 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 kind of missing piece of what has been, you know, oh, certainly the change in our political tone. I think a lot of it is that folks do not have a community based local paper they're growing up with in the same way anymore. There's not an agreement about facts that is happening uh, uh, from a local level, and then that filters up certainly to the national conversation, the cable, and the other parts. So I think that's a huge problem. Not only that, it's a problem because it does not create the same type of pipelines for journalists to work their way through the profession. And so I think that the erosion of local news is at the top of uh, kind of the concerns in the industry. And um, I don't know what the solution here is besides, you know, uh, you know, you know, folks talk about federal investments. They talk about, you know, the benevolent billionaires who will buy those things up. Mm -hmm. But what we do know is that they're being ravaged uh, uh, by, you know, some corporate folks, some hedge fund, you know, those groups who have found those as ways that they want to make money. And it has had a real impact. Uh, well, I think, in my personal opinion, that has had a real impact, not only on our ability to create and inform citizenry, but on the individual, on our profession. Uh, the first question I don't really remember, is a journalist taking <laughs> it? It has yeah. taken a toll on journalists this period. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I don't, yeah, like, <laughs> it's been hard. Uh, I think there's been a lot of intensity around the profession right now. I don't think that that is something that is going to change. Uh, I think that Trump might have started something, and but I think that we are in a kind of foremost crisis for the country. And so if you're writing about politics, you're going to be involved in that. Uh, but it has uh, made life hard, has prior, you know, has made that self-care more important and has made plugging out, uh, getting out sometimes, uh, uh, and, you know, more important also, but, you know, I'll kick it over to Lisa. Yeah, it has been intense. I echo that. It has been a very intense, um, few years, right from, I don't know, I don't even know, 2016, I guess it's been, been hot. Um, 
I think that we are seeing now, uh, I think the coronavirus also has had a separate effect too. I mean, the, the, just what we've been covering, the intensity of it has been hard on journalists themselves. But I think that the coronavirus we've seen has, had, has really done some serious damage to some outlets. Uh, and, and also it might be just changing landscape as well. But the Huffington Post just had dozens and dozens of layoffs. And, you know, these were some of the best journalists, you know, out there that were laid off. So, and NPR has been back and forth having issues with furloughs. Uh, so there have been some really serious problems with the business models in coronavirus times uh, that are hurting real journalists and real journalism. Um, I think on the subject of local news, yeah, it is absolutely worth saving. You know, I started as um, a one man band in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina and Florence. I was a print reporter in Myrtle Beach. I worked in Columbia, South Carolina. I love local news. And I, I will say this, I think that there's a difference between local television and local print. Mm -hmm. And I'm more, I'm more worried about local print. I think what's happened is local television has sort of become this kind of like octopus that's taken up a lot of the oxygen in these small towns. People have gone to TV advertising instead of print and they're not buy, you know, subscribing as much. And I think that's a tragedy because I can tell you as a um, hard-nosed TV reporter, you know, I, even in my best stories, and I was able to break some very big stories. I broke the story of the compromise to bring down the Confederate flag from the South Carolina State House. I don't know if I'll ever break a better story, you know, a more important one to me. But um, I was also covering fires. <laughs> I was also covering drownings, you know, versus the newspaper, which had a team of five reporters really covering the legislature. You know, I was, you know, hustling, doing the best I could. I had sources, but that I was never going to be able to devote the kind of expertise um, that the state deserved, that the newspaper could. And I have a crazy dream that somehow we see more of a hybrid model of newspapers and local TVs coming together where we get more print journalists doing an occasional live shot for the television station. Somehow there's a funding model there. I'm not, I don't know, I'm not a money person, but it, I, there's gotta be some way because I think local TV, which can do some good is dominating too much. And I think it's harmed local newspapers. So I'm going to bring us back with one final question from the audience on, um, on the election itself and ask you both to identify or recommend any key reforms we should make to ensure that there's not a repeat of the January 2021 insurrection. <laughs> well, yeah, if I knew. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Here is the answer. Um, yeah. You know, I will say I am I am personally a little disappointed that we have this is a little bit off the question, but uh, it does look now that there will not be a commission on the January 6th insurrection, which Nancy Pelosi had wanted. She um, her original plan was going to have it be more majority Democrats and not um, truly bipartisan. And that was part of what sank it. But I think there are going to be a lot of questions about that day that we still that we have for a long time, you know, having seen the rioters eye to eye and having interviewed them, um, I can tell you there, it was a wide spectrum of people, but they all kind of joined this mob um, in a way that, you know, I look back on it and I, I instantly thought I was even, as I was evacuating, I was talking to a member of Congress about this, that, um, you know, I've never really understood the Salem witch trials. Uh, weird side note, I'm actually like, I've got a great, great grandmother who was a Salem witch, don't, don't hold it against me, but, um, <laughs> I've never understood that mob mentality until I was in the Capitol on January 6th. And I saw people who were doing things and didn't seem really conscious of what they were doing. I saw some who were very conscious of what they were doing. And I saw that they had hate in their eyes and they had destruction in their eyes. There were others that were just sort of swept up in this and doing things that were, were bad and wrong and kind of, I, I don't know, I can't describe it, but I'd never seen how that mentality itself is a physical force in that way. And I, I wish we would get, spend more time talking about it. I think that the idea of election reform is not the problem, though it's always good to talk about that. I think we do need to talk about um, voter access. I think that's a huge problem in this country. But I, but I think the issue is more in the soul of the country a little bit in terms of media, how media works. How do we talk to people who are different than we are? How do we figure out what's true? And then how do we decide um, 
what right I have to impose my will on others because everyone in that riot felt they had a right to impose their will on the US Capitol. And when you get to that point, you know, and when those people think they're patriots, that, that's a more serious problem than election reform. That's, I, mean, I don't know if it's more serious, but it's a, it's a different problem. And I think that's the problem we have. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm um, probably, you know, I'm not the person I would ask if I was looking for encouragement here, uh, because <laughs> I think um, a lot of this stuff is uh, a reflection of a country that is still uh, wrestling with its very baseline questions, right? So if you talk, if you think about this as a democracy that's been stable for 200 years, that had this, 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 you know, unforeseen moment on in January, then yeah, it looks like this anomaly that makes no sense. But if you think about it as a country that really has only frankly had a full democracy for maybe 40, 50 years, and that that has always been back, may featured moments of backlash, many of which have been violent when uh, uh, folks who were not originally intended made voice. Uh, I think that this is another step in what has been a long arc of, you know, as Lisa said, the kind of soul questions of this country. And I think that that to me is what we really saw on the 6th is that there has to be a larger, you know, I think we're going to have a, frankly, um, that uh, a majority of, of, of folks in this country will have to decide whether it's democracy that they wanted or whether it was a system of power that only produced, you know, the, their results. And uh, frankly, I think that that is not a question that we can assume uh, everyone is on the same page about. And I think that we are going to have a real test of media, of politics, of, of our elected officials to see just like what the true values uh, that connect us are. And um, I think that that is going to be central to any uh, upcoming administration, you know, as the country kind of demographically changes, as, you know, there are, you know, states that are rapidly changing places, obviously, like Georgia, um, we're going to have those, uh, uh, frankly, um, power struggles. And uh, I don't think there is any clear answer to me for anyone to be confident about the way that plays out. Just, and I know you're trying to wrap this up, but that that was so well said. I, I just think I, I think this conversation is so important because what happens is um, a side that has power, whenever it's threatened with losing that power, often does well by just waiting it out. You know, and I think that I do have hope in this moment because I think we're having these direct conversations. I think we need to be even more direct and even get more uncomfortable than we are now. But but the question is, can we keep this up? You know, you think about what happened in Newtown, Connecticut where you saw 20 first graders murdered and there was a groundswell of calls to change our background checks in this country, make it harder uh, for someone uh, yeah. like the assailant there to get a gun. But then gun rights opponents just waited it out and, and, and that died down, you know, it's still there. But so, so that, I guess my point is that for, for things to, um, th th this conversation needs to keep going. And I think people who want to hold on to power probably don't want it to keep going. But if we want to have a real conversation about who we are, we have to be really intentional about it. And it won't be easy. It won't be easy in six, eight months from now when it, the riot is so far behind us. Absolutely. So I'm going to ask each of our presidents to make very brief comments, 45 seconds um, each, and uh, we'll wrap it up. And, and uh, so let's start tonight with President Murray. Presidents can't speak in 45 seconds. <laughs> the, uh, I just want to say I'm, this, this gives me a boost of optimism. Uh, when Jeff Rosen was talking about the Constitution, it made me realize how strong the Constitution is. Here are two fine journalists talking about how they continue to make themselves better, broader sources, getting voices in who haven't always been heard. It's really wonderful. We've got a million challenges in this country, but I think we have... Uh, people here who will continue to drive journalism professionally and get more voices included from across this great country. Thanks. President Haas. Thanks, Mark. We do choose who we listen to and uh, listening to uh, these uh, professionals tonight, we can have uh, great confidence uh, that they represent an industry that has to continue to inform us as, as citizens. And I think it's so important also to understand Lisa and others put themselves into harm's way. 
and we cannot uh, but say thank you for the opportunities that we have listening to you tonight and other journalists and uh, journalists who have in fact uh, put their lives in harm's way for us to understand the story. Thanks, Tom. President Lubbers. My greatest fear for future elections is the effect on them by an internet industry driven by profit. Facebook, Google, and others <clears throat> use the manipulation of people to accomplish their objectives. The psychological effect they are beginning to have could be used to influence elections by creating false realities on which citizens base their votes. <clears throat> Correct regulation of that industry may be so important as the passage of fair voting laws by states and federal government to make voting in our country fair and based on fact. Thank you. And let me just, um, Lisa Asted, uh, thank you on behalf of all four of us. And I think the notion of the four of us over many generations of serving this institution is symbolic of keeping the conversation going and not living in a crisis of the moment. And your presentations were genuine, they were authentic. And um, we started on the election, but it was so wonderful the way the complexity of our systems, election, media, power, what's true, all came into the conversation. So tonight was uh, journalism at its finest. And so thank you so much for the work you do every day um, at the New York Times and at PBS. And we're just so uh, grateful that you joined us and led us through this conversation. I'd like to turn for just a quick moment, 30 seconds to Brent Holmes, our executive director of the Howenstein Center so that he can share with us um, the next session of the Presidential Roundtable. Brent. Thank you, President Mantella and past presidents Haas, Murray, and Lovers. Uh, we're honored to have continued the Presidential Roundtable series this evening with Usted and Lisa uh, for an engaging conversation. Please join Grand Valley State University, the Hounstein Center, and the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation on April 6th at 7 p.m. for the culminating installment to this presidential roundtable series. Best-selling author Robert Putnam and his co-author Shailen Romney Garrett will join the conversation focusing on democracy. Please ensure, please ensure to watch your mail and email for announcements about this upcoming conversation. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and have a great evening. <laughs>